Okay, so search engine optimization. Search engine optimization is all about this box, and to a lesser extent, other boxes that are like it on Bing and Yahoo and even on Facebook and uh, YouTube and so forth. But a billion, over a billion times a day, people go to this box looking for something. And of course, they type in something they're looking for, and out the other side comes a search engine results page, the SERPs is uh, sort of the vernacular um, in, the, in the industry. And well, there's different, there are two general different types of results that are out there. Now, it does get more complicated than that, particularly, you know, you're seeing all kinds of new stuff all the time. But in general, there's two general types of results that come back. What are called organic and there's paid. Uh, so paid is where someone says, I'm willing to pay Google or whatever search engine it is whenever someone clicks on my ad. And in general, the more you're willing to pay them, the higher you go up in the listing. There's more to the algorithm than that. It has, some, you know, it has also to do with things like how relevant are you, you know, how, uh, how credible is your site, things like that. How well, how well written is your ad and so forth. And that's one whole side of search, of search engine marketing. The other side is the organic side. These people over here are not paying every time you click on their links. But they had to invest a lot to get this top placement. In fact, if we look at the word mountain bikes, we see that there are seven points, nearly 7.7 .7 million results. And so what these people have had to do is they've had to prove to Google that they are more relevant for that term than 7.7 .7 million other pages. That can be a lot of work. How do we go about doing that, though? That's just real quick. Actually, real quick, we're going to take a look at uh, organic versus paid. Um, What's interesting is that one of the things that I've noticed is that there's a lot of people that tend to focus on one or the other, and really it's nice to blend the two. To blend the two, um, they both really have very different characteristics. Uh, the nice thing about paid is you've got a lot of control over them. Um, so you pay, how much are you going to bid for it? What is the what what is the uh, the, ver the text in the ad say? What page does the ad go to? Um, you can turn it on and off. You can do all kinds of things. Like, I only want to geo-target people that are in this city. There's a lot of control that you have with paid search. The huge negative is you're having to pay every time someone clicks through. And that's one of the big advantages of organic search. The other advantages organic search has is that organic search is clicked about 70, about 70 percent of the time. So if you have a number one rating in organic search versus a number one rating in paid search, you're going to get about two clicks. More, or you're going to get a, an extra, twice as many clicks on the organic side. Um, the other thing is that you tend to see on the organic search side that there's a stronger ordering dominance. Um, something very interesting that I noticed uh, years ago is that people would call us up and going, oh yeah, you guys are the number one rated website design company in Dallas. And I'm like going, I never want to ask people like, really, we are? Where'd you see that? You know, so yeah. But eventually, what I realized was they were talking about Google. I'm going, well, I didn't want to tell them. Well, you know, Google doesn't actually go and rate our company. They're just looking at things on our website. There's a lot of people that thought that that really had a lot of merit, where you don't see that as much on the paid side. So you know, there's advantages to both. To both. Which though, long term, is the most important? It's going to be organic search. Um, in fact, the way that, uh, so some of the reasons is that we looked at, they're clicked more often, perceived more authoritative. Um, generally, there's a better long-term ROI. Now, a lot of times there's a lot of work, particularly for high competitive terms, to get placed well. So there's that initial investment. But over the long haul versus having to pay for all those clicks, generally you're going to find in the long term that organic has better, has better uh, um, ROI. And then we talked about the ordering dominance. Um, and so achieving a high organic placement can be extremely powerful competitive advantage. Um, there are companies that I've seen literally that uh, for every dollar they've spent in organic search, they're making 20 back. Now, that's somewhat, that's not the usual. Um, but, you know, if, it's, if the timing's right and you can dominate, particularly like when a new set of phrases is coming out, some new technology comes out or something like that, and you can dominate, a lot of times you can stick on there for years without a ton of work. Um, it's amazing the, the returns that it can provide. Um, so how do we place well in organic search? Oh, and one last thing I do want to say about paid. Paid is something that I do recommend people doing a certain amount. And basically there's two main reasons, you, two main places you want to be doing paid. One is if you can get a positive ROI. In other words, if you can 
spend $1,000 and get uh, $1,500 back in value, do that every day of the weekend on Sunday. What you can't get positive ROI on, though, there's still a second reason that you might want to do it, is to research keywords for organic search. See how well they resonate with your audience. See how well those people convert, how much value they bring. Because if you've got some keyword, like say mountain biking, you want to know, are, are people really seeing that as a powerful term? Is that really going to convert before we spend all this effort trying to place for it? Um, a great example of this is when we first got started in search engine optimization, we optimized for the term web design. And what we actually found was, and it was a lot of work to place for web design. And what we found was most people searching for web design were not looking for companies to hire. If they typed web design Dallas, yes. If they typed web design company or professional web design, yes. But web design by themselves, they were looking for tutorials on web design. So it ended up being actually a very ineffective word. It didn't convert very well. So I think I remember like uh, web design would convert maybe at about 3%. In other words, converting someone filling out a form and contacting us. Web design Dallas would convert at about 10 times at about 30%. Um, so if we had done some research using pay-per-click to figure that out beforehand, we wouldn't have had to waste so much time trying to go after such a competitive word. So how do we place well in the search engines? There's, there's uh, really kind of, two, there's, there's kind of two different points of view on this. Um, and there's a the red hat versus black hat. Basically, you know, this goes back to the day of the old spy novels, um, where you had the, the white hat guy was there, or the old cowboy movies. Um, where the white hat guy was the good guy, and the black hat guy was the guy who was up to no good. And it's sort of the same thing that you have over, over on the uh, search engine side. And basically what white hat is about is that you know, we're trying to get the search engines to place our web pages well for certain terms. White hat means we're doing things that the search engines agree with. Black hat means we're trying to trick them. We're trying to do things that are not in their best interest. The challenge is that there are certain things that you can assume are one side or the other. There's other ones that change over time or are hard to know about. There's another tactic that people use to place well. Uh, there's two, you know, two sides to this. One is we can create really great content. Um, the other part is we can just create what I call search engine fodder, which is basically cheap content, that we, but we can create masses of it. This technique has been used for a long time. And some people would even argue that that's really kind of black hat. Although a lot of times it's not strictly black hat, maybe more in the gray areas, but it provides very little value to end users, but it's cheap to produce and so a lot of people use it. Here's what you'll typically see happen when you try these different tactics. So if we take the long view, it could take a while. On a new website, it might take six months to a year um, to start placing well if you're actively working on it. Um, but once you do it, if you're following, you know, if you're building great content, you're doing it in a white hat way, you're going to see that that's going to stick and stay there for quite a while. This is what you typically see with Black Hat. Black Hat normally works well in the beginning. Um, I, it's amazing how many times I've seen these like crazy Black Hat campaigns, and you're sitting there going, wow, they're ranking awesome. Then all of a sudden one day they're not. Um, and that's because they got found out by the search engine. And it could be that the algorithm changed, something programmatically changed, and they figured out, aha, you're playing some sort of trick on us. Um, or it could be that a human, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a staff member over at Google went to the website, looked at it, and goes, ah, yeah, no, that's, you're playing games with our algorithm. We're banning you. We're penalizing you. Can it ban them individually like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the father one, you'll see some, you can sometimes see some decent results with this, although normally the results are pretty limited, and eventually this starts to roll off. One of the main reasons you start to see it roll off is because the search engines have been trying to do a better job understanding um, not just what's on a page, but do people find this interesting? Are people retweeting it? Are people posting on their Facebook? Are people staying on this website for a while? And if they start to kind of figure out, oh, this is kind of garbage content that people aren't finding valuable, you're going to start to roll off over time. And so while these shortcuts a lot of times will work in the short run, they actually are, are uh, problematic in the long term. And actually, well, I won't, I won't get into, there's, there's a lot of agencies that have, have, have made, you know, made their living off of figuring out these, these loopholes um, and then go out of business when stuff like this starts happening to their clients. So just stay away. Stay the course is the, the moral of the story. Um, so how do we know what is white hat? 
Well, Google does tell, like Google does tell us for the most part, but there's a more sort of like a general arch or overarching philosophy that basically what Google's trying to achieve is they want to be, if you've ever been to a, ever been to like a networking meeting, and there's that one person in the room that seems to know everyone. And so, you know, someone, almost that godfather type figure, people go up to and go, hey, do you know a good plumber? Like, oh yeah, this guy's a great plumber. It's like, oh, you know a great place to get pizza. This person wants to be the expert at, send, at helping people out and sending them to good quality content. Well, that's exactly what Google's trying to do. They want to be the expert at helping people out and getting them to the right resources they want. That's how they get tons and tons of people coming to their website. They just want to do it programmatically, and, they can only, and so they're trying to mimic this human behavior as best they can. And so always remember that if we work hard to be a great recommendation, we, re we, we are that great pizza place or that great plumber or we've got great content, which is what a lot of people are looking for, then we're doing what Google wants and we're in line for the long term, um, uh, uh, aligned with them in the long term. So let's break it down a little bit more into what are we, what are we really trying to do. There's three main areas. Uh, so I call it sort of the magic formula of SEO. There's three main areas that we're working with three things that we need to satisfy in order to get some great rankings. The first is great architecture. We have to have a site that's well coded, that doesn't confuse the search engine robots. Um, the great thing is, is that the system that we're using, automatically out of the box, great architecture, you don't have to do anything with it. Um, if you're coding things uh, in Dreamweaver, if uh, there's other content management systems out there that are not so much that way, but most modern CMSs are actually of pretty good architecture. The one caveat I will say is you can have your themer totally destroy all of that, but it's rare. You've really got to have a, a themer that's uh, focused on destroy, uh, that really doesn't know what they're doing. It's got to be pretty clueless to, uh, but I have seen themers that have gone and put tons and tons of JavaScript at the front of a, at the front of a page. And I'm like, no, move that to a side page. So outside of the theme, you generally don't have to worry about the architecture on your site. Great backlinks and buzz. Um, so what backlinks are about is backlinks are how many other websites and web pages are linking to yours. This is actually the magic that made Google what Google is. If you go back to the late 90s, you had Excite and Lycos and Yahoo and all these different search engines that are out there. And basically, they would just read the content of a page. And if someone typed in something like, uh, someone typed in something like computers, um, they didn't know the difference between, so Joe's computer shack around the corner could put better content on their web page than Microsoft. There was no barrier to Joe's computer shack placing better than Apple or Microsoft or any of the really big boys. And so the, the guys, uh, Larry, uh, Larry Page and, and Serge, when they started Google, they said, what's something that's different? They actually studied how academic papers were written, sort of what, uh, what uh, Pareto was looking at, that whole power law principle, and said, you know, when you write a great academic paper, other people reference you. And we can measure these references online because they are called links. And so when someone links from one website to another website, they're basically voting for that other website and say, I, think, I see this person over here as good content, as authoritative. There are, of course, ways to fool the search engines and so forth, which you try to stay away from. Buzz is something that's come around a little bit more recently, and this is really revolving around social media. Um, so. Their backlinks have to be constructed a certain way, a normal backlink for the search engines to understand it. Search engines can't see backlinks in Facebook because you have to be logged in to see anything in Facebook. And Google can't just log in and see that. Um, although there, there's, there's techniques that are being worked on. And so they're trying to come up with other ways of how do we measure sort of this buzz uh, when people are tweeting about things. Because like tweets are a very small piece of data that goes away quickly. Um, in fact, I think they, they go away after like two, I think they, they get deleted out of the database after a couple of weeks or so. And, but they want to be able to measure all of this buzz. And in particular, what's really important to the search engines is this backlink strategy is great, but it's great for old, stable content. It doesn't work particularly well whenever there's some big news article that comes out and they want to figure out like who's, who's giving the, the best report on this because links take a while to build. They've got to be static. So that's where Buzz and Twitter and Facebook and all these other things come into play on Google+. So the third part is great content. Um, and great content is going to have two components. Uh, one component we've already been talking about. How do you write great content 
for humans. And in general, what the search engines are going to try to look at is buzz, time on site, various different things like that to figure out because they can't read pages like a human. But they're going to try as best they can. But there is a set of technical things that they're looking for. And so we want to build our great content around some of those technical things. So the process that we use in search engine optimization, we already talked about the uh, standard topic-driven approach to creating content on our site. So we have user-driven content, we have author-driven content, we have organization-driven content. That creates topics, and then we author content around it. And we've already been through that. That's a very typical thing that goes, you know, happens on a website. We need to take a few more steps for this to place well in the search engines. One, whenever this content's being authored, we need to understand what keywords are in this content. And then we need to optimize, uh, we, and we need to understand which ones are effective keywords, and then we need to optimize that content around that. We'll take a look at how that works. Now, if we're really doing SEO properly, though, we're going to have a whole other workflow. And this workflow is going to be around keywords. Now, in reality, it's just a subset of user-generated topics. Because, but instead, what we're going to be looking at is what are users typing into the search engines that they're looking for? And there's a certain set of tools that we're going to look at three primary factors. What are the most popular words that people are looking for? You know, how many times a day is some phrase being used? How relevant is it to our organization? So if we have a bike shop, um, something like, you know, mountain bike parts or something like that, Katy Perry would not be relevant, even though a ton of people are searching for her. Um, and then competition. Uh, we saw that mountain bikes had 7.7 .7 million, but if we sold a particular brand of mountain bike, that would probably have a lot less competition. Or maybe even a certain model might have even less. And so we want to we try to find words that have that nice balance between a lot of people searching for it, it's relevant, and there's not a lot of competition. From there, we're going to create a set of keywords, and we're going to prioritize these. Um, we talked about it only briefly, but you do want to create a queue of topics. We want to create a queue of keywords. And then we run through the same process, that we have our writers go and pull these keywords, write content. Then we want to do some micro keyword analysis on that content. Maybe there's some special long tailing we want to do, something like that. Um, optimize the content around those keywords, and then we go promote. So the way that we have done this for years, and the way this is done by agencies all over and internal teams and so forth, is that generally you start with some brainstorm of keyword phrases. Um, and a lot of times we might ask a client to give us five to ten keyword phrases that describe what, what they think their users are searching for to find them. Um, there are tools that we can then use to go and find out how popular those keywords are, to find synonyms. Um, to long tail, to figure out sort of modifier keywords and so forth, that we can then go and come up with a giant list of potential keywords. The problem is that we generally don't know which ones are the most relevant to that particular brand because we don't know their business. So we've got to send them back this keyword list. And they evaluate the relevancy. And then we come back with sort of this, this, uh, um, this organization. So there's a lot of this back and forth to figure out relevancy, comp competition, and so forth. Um, years ago, the primary tool that we used was called uh, Word Tracker. Um, there are, and there's a couple of others we'd mix in. Now we primarily use um, the, the so Google has a free tool, um, uh, the Google Keyword Tool. Um, but we're going to be looking at something here in a second, though that'll they'll kind of augment they'll augment all that. So the way that you know this is traditionally done is you create all these spreadsheets and you email around and you do all this kind of stuff. And the problem that we found with this whole approach is that it just it wasn't really used very well. So you know, eventually, you might come up with a spreadsheet that the person who understands the keywords has, but the content writers don't necessarily have access to. It doesn't get updated on a regular basis. And so this is just a highly ineffective way of keeping. And that's the other thing. It's not just something you do once. It's something you need to come back and revisit on a regular basis, generally about every six months. It depends on you know, how seasonal, how new the technology is you're working in. But if it's something like a bike shop, you probably get away with every six months to a year, because that's a fairly stable, the new keywords don't change. But if new models are coming out, we need to know those numbers. And so what we wanted was a way for all of this to be brought into the website. Primarily because the model we're using is we want our subject matter experts to be writing, 
not a bunch of just SEO people that are unrelated to the company. And so I'll show you how this system works. So if we go back to our apps, we have an app that brings in all these keyword tools for us. Um, it's going to bring in a lot more than that. It's kind of all in one package. Uh, so it's called the SEO tools. And this is where apps is really great. Um, in the old version of Drupal, you literally had to download something like 16 different components to get this to all come together. Where in this, it does it all automatically. Search engines really don't use the meta keyword. Um, they'll use meta description, though, um, normally for a write-up, not normally for ranking purposes. Um, and then there are some other things they look at, like some there's location tags, and there's a couple of other things that they might be looking at. It'll be interesting to see how things change as the web becomes more semantic. Um, and actually, Drupal is the first CMS out of the box that uh, has full semantic markup. So it has Dublin, I mean, I won't bore everyone with the details, but it has Dublin Core built into, um, built into it in Core. So you've got semantic markup. Um, what does that mean, semantic markup? Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think the best. I, I'll tell you what, let, let's hold that question. I'll cy cycle back around about what, what semantic markup's all about. Um, And let me run back. And so uh, one thing I'm going to need in these SEO tools is we're going to need to connect to some third-party data sources. Remember I talked about APIs? So there's some APIs we're going to need to connect to. Um, one is WordStream, which gives us basically free keyword data. Um, I think you can search like up to 200 keywords a month, um, which is pretty good for a mid-sized site. They've got paid programs beyond that. Um, And then there's another service I'm going to be using, Alchemy. Um, I'll, I'll show you what Alchemy does when we get to it. It basically extracts keywords. Um, it's actually a pretty amazing service. It's also freemium, but they let you run like 10,000 queries a day. It's like you'll, you'll never go over it. Um, OK, so we've now, we're now got our system connected to keyword extraction to third-party services and um, keyword data. And so I can start by doing my keyword research. So here, I can go in, and let's say I just start with the word bike. I want to submit it, and I want to see what kinds of, what types of variants are people searching for. And what we see is, here's the word bike. Um, I can also bring in data from other sources. So for example, I can go to Google's keyword, uh, keyword tool, and I can actually run those reports, export it, and pull it in here. Those will give me some competitive numbers in some other areas. Basically, Word, uh, WordStream is just giving me um, numbers as far as popularity. Bike, I know, is going to be t way too competitive, so I don't particularly want to focus on it. Bike part, that starts to become a pretty good one. So I can sit there and flag it and go, you know, I don't know how important this is, but I'm going to make it to be determined. Um, mountain bike, well, we sell a lot of mountain bikes. Let's make that a high priority. Um, and we can kind of go down the list and pick different keywords that we think are important. Um, so bike paths, eh, we don't really have that. Motorcycles isn't going to be important. Um, road bike, we sell those. Let's make that high, too. Um, so then we can kind of go through doing this research, and we come up with a prioritized list of keywords. And I have it actually set up in basic mode, where it's just five levels, uh, high, uh, top, high, whatever. You can actually break that down into 100 levels. And we can associate a value, uh, which gets into like measuring some metrics. So we say every time someone comes to visit our website using this keyword, it's worth a dime, or it's worth you know, 50 cents, or whatever it's going to be. So that's the general approach on how we can keep a queue of content. What's cool is, is that we can have a whole team of bloggers or wiki writers or whatever we want it to be, and they can come and see this information. They can see how many posts have been written about that particular topic and go, you know what, this is an important keyword. I'm going to go write on this, I'm going to go write on this particular topic. So once they decide they're going to go write on a topic, we need to go through some page keyword research. Um, so we might have a general keyword. So we might be writing for the keyword, um, 
Well, we'll work with it by, so basically what we want to do is the first thing we want to do is extract the keywords. If someone's writing a piece of content, we want to extract the keywords that are naturally occurring in this piece of content. Um, it's going to be easiest to, we could completely change out the keywords if we want to, but in general it's going to be easiest to work with what we're already given. Um, then we're going to come up with the, so we've got a keyword list of what's in our content. Then we're going to go do the same research. Uh, figure out like what are the most popular phrases, which modifier phrases. And then when we're done, we generally want to come up with one targeted keyword with maybe a few modifiers. Um, and what I, might, what I mean by that is, uh, we'll, we'll see this in a second. I'll just show it in the demo. So to show how this works is run back over to my blog. And I'm going to go into our fit to fat, how a bike can change your life. Um, and click the edit. And we now actually have a new area down here called content analysis. I'm going to go ahead and click on analyze content, and it's going to go and extract the keywords from my content. This is what Alchemy does. In fact, Alchemy actually does it. It's really kind of, kind of amazing how it works. These are keywords. Here are various different concepts, and it can even do entities. There's no entities here, but if there's things like a person's name, cities, um, things that are, that are like sort of newsy type things, they'll show up underneath entities. But for SEO purposes, I'm primarily concerned about keywords. And I see, well, biking shows up a lot. That's not that important. Um, but as I go down here, I go, ah, lose weight shows up. So it could have, could have been weight loss, could have been whatever. Lose weight's naturally showing up. Let's do a little bit of research on that. So I click the button. It's going to go and hit WordStream and come back with some, pro some um, popularity analysis. And so we see that lose weight's the most popular. Lose weight two, I don't know if they're about, ooh, lose weight fast. And we're starting to get into a longer tail word. It's three words. It's pretty nice. I also have these buttons over here. They'll give me more analysis. In fact, actually, I was, when I was looking at biking, so you can see like different trends is becoming more important. This is a seasonal term. So we get access to, to various other things. Uh, this one here will give you like synonyms. Um, so, and these are all like free tools. There are some services where you can do some paid tools with this also. And so I say, you know what? I am going to go and focus on lose weight fast. So once we have that information, we need to optimize our content around it. So there's a general cheat sheet, and I'll say these are just general guidelines. Um, there is no hard and fast rule. Uh, in fact, what you want to do is I, you, st you can start off by using this cheat sheet, but once you get used to it, you want to start modifying it. Go beyond the rules and see what works for you, because there is such a thing as over-optimization on, a, on, a, on a, your content. But in general, if you follow these rules, you'll tend to do better than if you don't. So a page title can be up to, up to 75 characters. You generally want to be using as much of it as you can. Um, you want to have your targeted keyword phrase in there at least once. Body, generally 200, 800 words, so forth. Getting in the meta, met, you, know, met, you want to have a meta description. You want to have some meta keywords. That area is not particularly critical for placements, only the first two. And of course, the tricky part is, so the way we used to teach this is here's your cheat sheet. So someone takes their content and they pull it over into a word processing, do, into like a word processor and it counts their words and they count the occurrences and all that kind of stuff. So hey, well, let's just bring this into the system. Um, it's ridiculous bringing it back and forth. And so what we have is you can go down here and say, all right, well, I want to focus on, I want to focus on lose weight fast. Let me go back and reanalyze my content. Turn off Alchemy real quick. And so it's going to tell me how many keywords do I have? How many times is it used? It's going to come back with some recommendations. I close this out, and the recommendations are actually here and available for me. And so it says, ah, well, I don't have my keyword here. So let's go ahead and one simple way to do that is I'm going to change out fat to fit and make that how to lose weight fast, how am I doing, I refresh, and now I've got my title optimized. Come down here to my body. Eh, all right, so I need to have it in. I've only got it in there one time. I need to do it one more time. I'm going to find a simple place to put it. Aha, lose weight. I'm going to go ahead and put lose weight fast. And one of the nice things about the fact that we extracted our keywords to figure out what we're going to write about is that we've got, we can do these types of things easily instead of reconstructing our sentences. Um, so I scroll down. I go, hey, how am I doing now? Hey, I'm optimized. All right. So now we've got our post optimized for lose weight fast. And that's a rough estimate. I mean, it's a, that's a rough optimization. 
Um, but it's actually a pretty effective way. Um, you know, it's a pretty effective way to optimize content quickly. One last thing we've got is there's an insight dashboard, which basically goes through all of our content and will tell us, and this will update on the hour or update when whatever it's called cron runs. Um, but if we want, we can analyze things automatically. And so it tells us we've got that blog post has already passed. It's been optimized. Um, I can go ahead and say, hey, this one failed. It failed, actually, and we can look at why did it fail. It failed because I didn't put any keyword. Like, there's, there's no content, actually, in that page. So it tells me all that information. So we can sit there and go through and know what content we need to be optimizing. Is there a setting that is so using that a keyword in the description? Mm -hmm. This will analyze that information. It's just giving you more of the data. It doesn't, so what ends up happening, see how these turn red? These, it's just giving you the data. It doesn't like, and you can actually turn, you can actually change all the settings. So you can, um, I would have to go find it. I actually wrote this module, but it took me a while. There's actually a place where you can sit there and change all this to however you want. So there's like defaults. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And and I went and I went I went through it fast because it's it's built into it's built into that automatic tool. So you know that's the basics of optimizing your site. That is no problem. That's the that's the essentials and the foundation. Um, So I'm not going to get a whole lot. We're running out of time. I'm not going to get a whole lot into social media. Um, social media is huge. Everyone should pay attention to it. It's kind of a big deal. Um, oh, man, I love that story. Uh, but anyway, um, there is a certain I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into it. I, what I did want to show you, though, is how to quickly do a basic integration of social media into your website. Um, so pretty much, you know, the cycle for setting up your social media accounts is roughly the same. You go and you create an account. Some of them, like Facebook, for example, if you have an organization, you want to create a page. Um, where Twitter, you just create a, an account directly for your organization. Um, but you create these accounts, and then we want to get them integrated into our website. In particular, there's two, well, there's three, uh, there's three ways that we want to integrate into our website. And I've got this slide here. One, we want to create the links to our profiles. Um, the other thing we want to do is add the ability for people to share content uh, using social media. And then we might want to integrate in certain social media widgets. One of my favorite social media widgets is the Facebook like. So you create a page. So Result Bikes would create a page on Facebook, and then they could put a block on their page that whenever people go there, it says, hey, you can like us directly here. You don't have to go over to Facebook. And I'll even show you your friends that have already liked that organization. This used to be, this used to be one of the most tedious things to put on people's websites. Um, and so we built, we built an app to solve that problem and, just, and streamline this whole process. So we go down here to the social media app. And it's going to run us through a configuration wizard. What's the IN protection? Oh, uh, LinkedIn. It's, L, it's LN, LinkedIn. Oh, it's just because of the way the, the shading's working on those icons. And so we're into the wizard. The app's now installed. We're into the wizard. Um, so I just go through and let's see here. I put in our profile information. I'm not going to worry about Flickr. I'll put in Google+. And because it can't extract our, our name from that, I just got to put in a username for it. Let's go ahead and throw in LinkedIn. Not going to worry about SlideShare. We'll put in YouTube. Click Save. And now I need to get this projector recentered. So now it's saying, you know, what's, what are these icons do you want to have in your profile widgets? 
Um, it's going to throw in the RSS feed for good measure. We can uncheck if we didn't want any of these, but these look good. We'll just go with those. Then the next thing it says, it says, all right, well, these are your sharing widgets. This is for sharing content. Which ones of these do you want? Um, we'll go ahead and go with all of them. I could switch out to counter icons. These actually run through add this, so there's like stats on them and stuff like that. Uh, for now, I'm just going to keep the basic set that's up here. And then the last thing it's going to ask is where do I want these to show up? Um, I'm going to go ahead and accept these defaults. It also gives me access to two other really popular. This is that Facebook like that I was talking about. And down here is our Twitter feed um, for, for the for the site. I'm actually going to put that in a slightly different place. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and leave it in sidebar a second. And these are just regions that are sort of around the website. So there we're done. So up there is all of our, all of our uh, profiles. Now it'll take me to Facebook and so forth. This here is all of our sharing widgets. So whenever you know, I'm on my blog post and I want to share, I can do that there. Um, here's this is a very powerful uh, block, the uh, Facebook like. And here's this. One of the other things that's really kind of a cool little twist, and actually I got this out, I got this uh, idea from um, the Inbound Marketing book, is like, for example, Google Plus's URLs are crazy. And if you're ever out somewhere and someone says, hey, what's your Google Plus page? And you're like, um, it's a really long URL, I'll have to email it to you. What we put into this was a redirect system. So that you now say, hey, just go to my website, say resultsbikes.com slash Google Plus. Oops, that might not have been, maybe is an underscore? All right, let's try this with a different one. Yeah, well, it did for Facebook. I, I got to remember what the URL is for Google+. But so the cool thing is that way you don't have to remember what all of your, what all your pages are. Um, you can just type it in, you know, say whatever the name of your website is, and then you just got to know what the, what the uh, end hash is, and it will automatically redirect you to your pages. And then when you write content, all your friends can, you can go and share all your content, and then all your friends can go and share all your content. So, that's, there's the foundations of how to build a results-oriented website.